Thank you. 
And one last small thing, uh, due to the United Nations General Assembly, are you, uh, does UNICEF uh, run any side events for young people? Yes. You do? Yes. Oh, great. Love to talk. So I'm, I'm uh, going to be there for a conference during that same week for 
goalkeeper uh, uh, summit, which is run by the Foundation. Yeah. So it's interesting really just seem to know if there's something around that generation. Okay, I can see you're, you're doing this to each other, so you'll find each other. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank Good. you we'll so much. We'll see you in September and July. Okay. okay, thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for um, sharing this today. I promise I'll be shorter than the <laughs> um, My name is Dennis. I'm from uh, Social Enterprise of New York, the SG. We run a career program for young Singaporeans in New York City. Um, Clinton Christensen wrote a fabulous book called The Prosperity Paradox, and it spoke about how uh, innovation can lift nations out of poverty. Um, and he began his book with a criticism of the way aid is spent, the way funding has been, has been used um, in terms of lifting people out of poverty, including children. Um, and all the data that we see today, the success stories really comes out of China, right? Because they provided the biggest number of success, so the data is kind of skewed, but really it's coming from one country. So the question really is how do you think? The aid can be spent better. You spoke about the crying child uh, and how that you know really captures the attention. But how else do you think we can use the resources in a way uh, which is better than the past? Thank you. Um, so I've always had a proclivity toward public private partnerships because I think that they bring skills that you just don't get if you try to stay in your own sector. So to me, um, if you can design aid projects, whether they are short-term humanitarian, the child that is crying in front of you, or if it is long-term, 10, 20-year programs in which you are going to try to develop a nation, um, if you can do it with entities from the nonprofit sector, if you can do it with corporations and with government, you will get sustainable programs and they will fund themselves. Too often, we do um, programs just related to our funding. So, um, you know, in the world of development, we have a wall that comes down between humanitarian short-term funding and longer-term development funding. Well, that's not the way a beneficiary or a child looks at it. So if you're in the middle of a hurricane, all right, you get aid for one day, one week, six months. That's all you have the funding for. But then it isn't as if you have a house or a harvest crop or anything. So you're going to need to have help for another couple of years. And we don't have financing systems like that. And we separate our institutions between those that do humanitarian work and those that do development. And if we didn't do that, if we instead thought about how to do it as a, as a um, group, as a colloquium, we would have extraordinarily strong aid programs. That's my experience, and, and I just, I think often we, um, we overlook it because we have not spent time in the sector. Earlier we talked about Joe Nye's concept of tri-sector athletes. And so his premise, as you know, is that you need to spend time uh, working for the government, you need to spend time working in a non-profit, and you need to spend time working in a business. And those people who do, he calls tri-sector athletes, and they become very valuable to you because they can connect the world. So, at least to me, tri-sector answers are the way that you can make development much more effective in the years to come. Uh, hi, my name is Kandar Desai. I'm from India. Uh, I have worked in India with UNDP on some of these issues to engineer adoption rate quality, skill development for you. Uh, so, in the context of Asia, especially uh, in South Asian countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, we have a big population and the term population dividend is quite lost around quite frequently, but frankly, it looks like a very good scenario. You cannot educate the, educate the youth properly, you cannot give them proper vocational skills. Uh, they really have no future. I mean, uh, so, and the governments are not so well equipped to tackle these challenges. So, as Professor Professor mentioned, the problem is uh, achieving the scale in our initiatives. Uh, so, what is your perspective on that? The problem of scale in Asia, especially. 
So basically, I have a logistical question. So um, I was doing some mental health work for some of the awareness about like because people tend to recognize physical illnesses but not necessarily in the side. And I know it sounds very encouraged when I found out that the generation analytic actually deals with um, the mental health issues as well as all these vulnerable children who face, for example, post traumatic stress disorder. So I see the generation analytic has been really committed to the therapy, CPT for these children, and I'm wondering how is it carried out, in which areas, because I know it's your really, uh, sort of like, really young, actually has that, but in what other areas? And also, like, because they might grow up to have further problems and my surface again, right? So, are there any measures in place? And the last one is also, like, um, what kind of help um, would you guys want to see people taking from other countries with psychological resources that can come in? Yeah, thank you. One more question. Hi, I'm Rashi Mandel. Thank you very much for your comments and insights. I actually work with your communications team um, at UNICEF in New York for some time. So I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Um, my question, I hope it's not too specific, but it's with regards to countries that have overcome civil wars and tremendous uh, natural disasters, such as Sri Lanka. And what the challenges are for the children who are overcoming those scenarios on top of the resurgence of the recent conflict on a faith basis. Um, and what, in your opinion, would be some of the solutions to that situation? Thank you. Um, all right, well, very interesting questions. And we'll save it for before. Right? Yeah, okay, good. All right, so scale. Um, Scale is a very interesting puzzle, and we really don't have the answer to it because scale's problem is that it needs um, resources. It needs financial resources, it needs people, it needs commitment, it needs more drive. Sometimes it needs uh, legislation to really get scale, that's something Singapore has known. Um, and scale is a puzzle that I think we have not yet really understood in um, the development community. We um, have been looking at it at UNICEF in a way that we think can work. And it is that we definitely have public private partners at work on it. Uh, but scale is, um, we could use innovations on how people approach scale, how you design scale, how you place it into the beginning of a program. We are used to doing pilots. So we tend to test out an idea and we put the resources behind it, we see if it works, and then we think we can scale in every village in that country. And that is not necessarily true. We need to customize for what the local customs are and beliefs and um, familial systems. So it's a, it's a puzzle. I wish I could give you a really good answer, but we could use thoughts and ideas on um, issues that you think have scaled well, because we're looking for that. We're particularly looking for it around education, skilling, vocation, job matching areas. We really need scale around the world because we've got 10 million jobs a month we have to create in this world. Um, so um, then Jamie on mental health. Mental health is one of those areas that just does not get much funding. And I cannot tell you why that is, but we are increasingly talking about it. And your generation talks about it in a way that I think is very healthy and very important for the rest of the world. So I think we're catching on as a world. It's sort of like climate change. We're catching on as a world, but we're not quite there yet in mental health. Um, we're doing a lot of programs on both the research side as well as on the programmatic side. We do not feel that we know enough about the adolescent brain. We know more than, um, about some other times in life, but the adolescence is quite a puzzling time period in, them, in, a, in a life. So most mental health problems, as you know, start at the time of 13 or 14. 
So we've got to catch it early. We've got to understand it and know how to catch it. We have a number of programs. We'd love to talk to you in depth um, because your questions clearly indicate a depth that we really should focus. So the team here is that is attached to okay? And then um, in your second part was on how can you help with other countries. Did you ever experience uh, and, um, something that you think is relatable to another country? We have a number of platforms in which young people talk to other young people. And that is very helpful. So we have platforms on everything from um, child marriage, or female gender mutilation. If you've been through something and you want to share thoughts, we'd love to have you talk. Um, and then, Rashmi, uh, thank you. Uh, it's interesting, we just um, had a visit um, from the Sri Lankan delegation, and the question they gave to us is what do we do about religious cohesion within the country, and could we help with that? And so as we are thinking about it, uh, we'd like to help with this. So Rashmi, you may have some thoughts for us on that. But we will be trying to work on that. We, um, we can see that social cohesion is needed in most countries that have undergone conflicts. It is religious, ethnic, sometimes it is occupational. That's the problem that we have now in the Sahel, where the herders and the agriculturalists are um, at odds. But they need to go to school together, they need to um, share the classrooms together, they need to become friends. And this idea of social cohesion and how you can build it in the country is a big new area, and it is one that we are getting lots of requests for. So, anyone with suggestions is most welcome. This is an area that we can see for. Let's get to the next bunch of questions. Thanks, Minister. Uh, thank you for your speech, Ms. Hall. It was very inspiring. Uh, coming from the generation that is so called immigrant, I would like to say, uh, on behalf of the generation, thank you. So, um, okay, my, go for it. It's your time. So, um, I have a group of questions. The first question is How do you deal with challenges regarding the financing of long term projects, as you were saying, especially those in the bottom countries, which you were mentioning, uh, Syria, Yemen, and so on? How do you ensure continued funding for such programs, which obviously require a lot of resources, both human and financial. As for the human, how do you ensure that you have uh, continued monitor support? Because I understand that is a huge, um, that is a, that's basically the backbone of your entire operation, right? Um, then on the other hand, how do you also ensure that the, the money that you spend on doesn't end up uh, being used by corrupted governments? How do you ensure that it goes directly to those in need? The second part is uh, Singapore loves to spearhead uh, projects in the UN. So what can Singapore as a nation do to ensure the uh, continued assistance and aid for these um, unfortunate children? Thank you. Um, my name is Abdullah Ben Abbas. I am an MPP junior from Pakistan. Uh, uh, before coming here, I work in a private consultancy uh, and we focus mainly on healthcare to the social enterprise. Uh, and we are part of a different organization, including uh, many of the Harvard University, but there is a school, and we set up communities of care, trying to empower rural communities to take care of their own health care needs. But the problem came in, you know, when we uh, looked into sustainability. And as you said, you have a proclivity for public private partnerships. Uh, and I think that is the way to go as well. But the problem is, uh, in countries like Pakistan, the government and the bureaucracy are not very receptive towards um, public private partnerships when it comes to social projects. When it comes to infrastructure, roads, bridges, they're fine with that. But when you're dealing with people, that involves a lot more complexity. So, uh, number one, if UNICEF has any human resource or any kind of you know, people that we can approach, uh, it would probably facilitate us in. Um, reaching the government and getting something started, I would really love to move on there. And secondly, uh, independently, what would you suggest are some of the ways that social enterprises like ours can approach the government and actually get them on the table and get them to partner with us? Because otherwise, you know, the, the people change, the money rise up, and the project ends up uh, getting abandoned. So, the sustainability is always second and it's always in question. So, how do you suggest this can be overcome? 
Let's get a little bit of pressure to talk about this one. Good day, I'm Eric, and I'm a researcher with the National University of Singapore. So I, my research is in communication law and policy. So I was a keen observer to the Glen Apropocy Corp last year as part of the Young Move Group, which is the Young People's um, Organization. So um, what we feel in Young Group is that while they have been able to observe many of the high-level discussions that the UN's have been we do not feel that we are actually part of the process of decision making because we are heard, but our views are not synthesized into the kind of decision making. We now have we now have a great star in the name of Greta Thunberg, which is somebody you all should be quite familiar with by now. And we are seeing that the youth are not just willing to be heard, but also to actually start to be part of the decision making process. So how can the generation unlimited? Um, foster and integrate youth in this decision making process, not within generation unleaders' own decision making processes, as well as the highest levels of decision making and evaluations. Um, and anybody who has any answers in addition to being would be very welcome just to speak right up. Um, all right, so let's start with uh, the financing. Uh, financing is always difficult. And, um, you know, you mentioned Syria. So in Syria, we have had a, a humanitarian crisis because of the conflict. And uh, to solve the conflicts, it needs a political solution. And when there is a political solution, then people will feel good about backing the government, and they will begin to think about long-term funding. But we are at that in-between stage, and therefore, the world doesn't really have a type of financial instrument for that. Uh, we have a number of financial instruments that we work with. As you know, let's say in the World Bank, there is one for the least developing, the least developing countries, and they will often get grant financing. And then there will be one for the next level up, and they'll get a subsidized rate. And then the next level up, and then we'll end up with market rates, and then you're on your own. So uh, that works in some types of development, as you said, roads, power plants, things that have rubber return. It makes it more difficult for funding things like education. So education doesn't have any global fund the way, let's say, health does. We have some funding for um, uh, refugees. We have funding for children that are um, uh, uh, who have some disabilities. We have funding for certain countries. We have funding that would help the least developed countries try to strengthen their education system. But they're pieces, they're not the whole, and they don't let a country develop with it. So we need good financing options that actually work in our field. So go forth and create. Um, and, and, some, and, and we're hard at work on some. So let's say in education, Gordon Brown has a number of good suggestions about how middle income countries can finance their education systems. And that would be new. Um, and then corruption. Corruption is always a problem, and uh, corruption is something that we have seen in public sectors, in private sectors, in non-profit organizations. It is something that is a mindset. It is something that needs to be trained, and also need to have great profits. So we work hard at that. We also find that our best partners are not necessarily giving the money directly to the ministry, but it might be given to a nonprofit organization that can get something done. Or a consortium. And when a consortium is at work, they tend to monitor each other and it helps on corruption. Helps on the end of corruption. But corruption can exist in any part of society. I, I, mean, I wish it were not true, but it is. Um, Pakistan. So public private partnerships have um, have worked in a number of areas, and you can see it with early childhood development. There are a number of really good models out around the world, and now that Singapore is coming strongly into early childhood development, and the Prime Minister was very good to remarks on this, I think you will see some very interesting models of public and private collaboration 
to try to get relief and um, really focused on this and get everyone covered. In Pakistan, I would suggest that we get you in touch with our Pakistan country office. I think that would be best. So can I once again tell you that this little team, this little trio here on the first row, is your group. Okay, and then let's see what we can do to get you connected. Funding is always a problem, and then when funding leaves, then you end up leaving social impact and um, um, you just need them. And so we need to try to get sustainability, or it's very hard to do innovation. So we understand, and let's see if we can help. And then, um, Eric, um, the, uh, the voice of you. So this is a puzzling one. <coughs> Um, we have a number of initiatives in which we are actually um, involved in the group. And one is that we do, um, in Generation Unlimited, have you as part of our board. So you're actually sitting on our board, and depending if you want to sit on the board, you'll have to tell us so that we will know. We also have a whole category of you that we are reaching out to with questions. So we put your thoughts and ideas into the board meetings and into the programs. But that's still not enough. So at this next board meeting of UNICEF, since we are a children and young people's agency, we're inviting children and young people to come to our board meeting. So all I can say is it's coming. And just stay tuned. Keep um, knocking at our doors. We always have lots of youth and children programs every event we have some. So, I mean, this is, this is a really fun agency to link up with. So, so come join us, and uh, UNICEF House in New York is your house, so come visit. All right, and then, uh, let's make sure we tag in the team. Okay, so let's gather uh, the next bunch of questions that I see a few of you there and there. Oh. Okay, um, I'll make this very quick. Uh, Malcolm Murdoch, King's College London. Um, the great thing about UNICEF is that it does wonderful work. We need a magnet to bring as many people to it as possible. Voluntary service overseas, all that kind of stuff. We need medics, we need nurses, we need teachers, we need characters who are fresh out of school, out of university, who suddenly are taken off by the idea of helping others. This is a key thing, a key virtue. We've got to do it. We've got to have that back. Well, um, we all just say yes. Yeah. 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 It's just, it's where the world is. Yes. Good evening, I'm Ashton Sorrow from Sciences School Paris, um, from France. And I actually come to you with an observation. Uh, recently, I finished an internship here in Singapore at Morningstar Community Services. And we uh, and the place I was working for provides after-school care nights in which it helps families from broken, broken families and low-income families with children and provides good food, good education, and good um, enrichment activities. I know I'm from India, and we have a similar system that existed in Mumbai in uh, one of the NGOs that was close to my house. And I just thought it was very interesting for me to share it with you, since this um, after-school kind of service often helps keep children who have an affinity to skip school or engage in activities that are not welcome after school from the streets and provide them with good food, good care, and enrichment for, from, for things that they don't actually achieve. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Gabrielle, and I'm a high school student at Jamboree Academy Singapore. Um, my question for you would be, with regards to you facing our challenges and opportunities on a finite planet, what do you think the effect of social media movements like the school strikes climate will be on education? Yeah. My, my name is uh, Jacob. I'm here on exchange from uh, Bocconi University in Milan, but I'm German. Don't look that tell me. <laughs> um, yeah, after some years of experience in the private sector, I'm now in the MPP environment and exploring uh, 
the public sector trying to become maybe aspiring this free uh, this ethical, yeah, picture of the ethical game. Um, and with that, I learned about a lot of interesting initiatives, but I was wondering whether you can elaborate a little bit uh, specifically on this, which I find a super important and ambitious uh, initiative, how you ensure vertical and uh, horizontal coordination uh, within the orbit of the UN environment, and also vertical um, coordination with uh, let's say, from from my example, it's the EU. There's a lot of education initiatives, um, but here I could see maybe the ASEAN uh, group of nations here, um, and also businesses. How you just make sure you are most effective. You use the ideas that are already there, um, and yeah, just integrate all of this. Um, mm -hmm. That would be very interesting. Thank you. Very much. This will be the final set of questions. All right. So, Martin, it doesn't matter your age or where you um, enroll you in UNICEF. <laughs> uh, but I hope you all heard this and I hope everybody's been coming up with UNICEF. Um, so, Afshan, your morning side experience, uh, it, it is, um, I think, very important that you have those kinds of places where you can come after school, you can be enriched, and you can feel safe, and you can get some food and some. Uh, comradeship. Um, so, any of those ideas we would love to see and hear about. Um, we may know them, we may know them in another context, and we have not had an office here in Singapore, but we are hoping um, that we will be able to open one um, uh, soon. And if so, we will see more of the local programs. But in the meantime, people will tell us a bit about it. This tree, I was volunteering again. Um, we would, we would love to see what we can do because you are right. That this changes a child's life. Um, it changes anyone's life. You know, children. We we all know that instinctively, but we don't always do it. They need to feel loved and they need to feel secure, and they need to eat and they need to play and create with someone. And if we're not there, it becomes a different human being if they miss that. In your childhood, so we need to catch a new child. Um, Gabriel. Thank you. 